Hello, my name is Brian Yearling. I'm an Instructional Technology Coordinator. This presentation is about the journey to more meaningful technology use in the classroom. And it's really a basic introduction to the SAMR model made popular by Ruben Puntadora. So let's just agree with this fact. The day that the truck pulls in to deliver devices in a one-to-one -one program, teacher practice, student achievement, and general habits will not change. The arrival of the devices is not something that can strongly impact any of these key elements. This, the iPad, is not magical. This, who we teach, what we teach, how we teach it, how we'll know if students understand things, what students do with those tools, those are the things that are truly magical. So how do we move from a place where devices are looked at negatively, are not wanted, and are not something we are familiar with in our classrooms, to a place where we will not teach without the devices. This is the point in which we introduce the SAMR model. Again, the SAMR model was created by Ruben Puntadora, and it's a way of helping us to understand how teachers adopt and get used to the technology that's available in their classroom and how they learn to use it more meaningfully to impact what is most important, which is student achievement. Here you see a graphic of the SAMR model, and we're gonna go through each stage um, independently. But before we do, I do wanna explain one key thing about the SAMR model. While for most of us, it is unavoidable to start at the substitution level, especially when we receive new technology or technology we're unfamiliar with, none of these are absolute def definitive places that we start in or stay in. And every task that we do with students will have us sliding in different areas or different levels on the SAMR model. The key within the SAMR model is to stay above this line, imaginary line, above this line in the areas of modification and redef redefinition most commonly in our interactions with students. It means that these are the places where we begin to change what students do with the technology for more meaningful and constructive uses in order to impact student achievement more positively. But none of these are bad places to be. None of these are places that we are stuck in and none of these places are a guarantee that we will always be in. SAMR is about growth. It's about moving up the ladder so that we learn to use the technology efficiently enough that we, we live solidly in modification and redefinition most of the time with our students. So let's dive in and take a look at each of these. Substitution. This is the place where we start when we receive new technology or technology that we're unfamiliar with. The new technology is often used as a direct substitute for an older tool or for an older process that we're more comfortable with. There's really no change in the task undertaken by students or by teachers, and how these tasks are accomplished using the new tools is no different either. At this particular level, you'll see no noticeable improvement in student outcomes. So what does substitution look like? Well, perhaps you used to write with a pen or pencil or a typewriter, but now you use a program like Word or Pages um, to type that, to word process. Still doing the same thing. We're still just writing. We're just writing with a slightly different tool. Talk about research and reading. Before, we were you know, going to a library and doing this, but now we're going online to do it. We're reading it electronically, but we're still just doing basic research and reading. We're using an electronic tool to highlight text, define that text, maybe even take notes about that text. But still, these are, uh, these are tasks that we would have done previously using something like a dictionary, 
a thesaurus, or possibly even an encyclopedia. So what we're doing are things that we've always done. In the substitution phase, the use of technology can often seem unnecessary, clunky, um, and generally it doesn't improve how we do our work and sometimes makes it a little bit more difficult to do our work. This is natural and this is the place where people, people often question why we have adopted certain technologies for use in the classroom. But then a little bit of time passes, a little bit more experimentation happens, and we get into the level of augmentation. So here we don't see any massive changes. The new technology still substitutes for an older tool with real no, really no change in how the task was undertaken by the student. What changes in augmentation though is some of those features that are available now as a result of the use of the technology start to sneak in and improve how the tasks are carried out, maybe making things easier to do or faster to accomplish, or just adding enough flair that it makes it a little bit more engaging. So for instance, let's use that word processing example. Before, you were typing or writing everything, but now with the speech to text tool, we can now speak what we're thinking just to get our ideas down on paper. And the computer actually is able to interpret that and put the words down that we intended. It now helps students who maybe struggle uh, get get stuck in some sort of a writer's block to just get their ideas down and then they can work from there. That's a functional improvement. It doesn't change how we do the work, but it makes it a little bit easier. It maybe helps us get over a little hump that we had before. In this example, imagine that you're writing a resume. Previously, if you had students write a resume, you first had to teach them the format of a resume. You had to teach them the various ways that a resume could be laid out. They had to start from scratch and understanding that and building that into their Word document or into their um, into the resume that they were creating uh, by hand. Now we can use something called the template, which gives you some basic layout. You don't have to spend all the time explaining the format or understanding the format, and we can really focus on the content of that resume as opposed to the format and layout of that. That's a functional improvement. Here you see note-taking, something that can be done as a result of re uh, reading books online or using an e-reader like iBooks. Um, we can now take notes. That's something we've always done, so it's basic substitution, except for those notes can be easily searched online, right? They can be easily searched in the computer. So now if we're looking for a specific quote or for a specific note that we've made, we can very quickly type into a search bar and hop to the different notes um, and have them indexed within, within our, our ebook reader using the power of the computer. And that makes things a little bit faster and more efficient. Here is an example of a map. Think about a map that you used before, whether that was a paper map or a globe. Um, not only was it not always incredibly specific with small, unique individual places, but you never really got a sense for the geography of that, of the area that surrounded that. Now with something like Google Maps, we can zoom in and get a very specific view, picture, image of a very specific place. We can even go down to street level views and, and it just changes our understanding of where that place is uh, because of the functionality of the tools. Again, it doesn't change the fact that we are looking at a map and that we are trying to understand the geography of that area, but it changes how we interact with that tool. Then we slide into modification. And again, this is the point where we go above the line between augmentation and modification. Here's the significant difference. The tasks to be undertaken by students are now significantly redesigned in order to achieve some sort of a new educational goal or to ch changing the way that those educational goals are measured, the way students demonstrate what they know. The redesign though is made possible because of the features of the new technology, maybe things that weren't available to us before. So at this level, this is the point where students actually start to show noticeable improvements in their student achievement and student outcomes. And it's really because they're now being asked to do things differently than they used to be doing them, 
using the technology. We're now taking advantage of what the technology can do. We've redesigned the task itself. And now students have to think more. They have to put more creativity in it, into something, collaborate more. And this is where the, the point where technology really starts to change the game of what's possible in the classroom. We want to be living as often as we can in the world of modification with our students. So here's an example using iBooks Author. Now, using iBooks Author, students can record videos, they can record audio, they can perhaps create some uh, interactives in, a, in something like Explain Everything, and those can be dropped directly into an iBooks Author tool. Or the teacher can customize their own vocabulary, their own glossary. They can customize their own video tutorials, drop them in, and make a text that was once very generic and not customized to exactly what we need. Now make it very specific to what we're trying to teach and the outcomes we're trying to achieve in our classrooms. Perhaps we're looking at data. Now with the ability of a spreadsheet, we can begin to turn numbers into graphic images and, and, and charts. And we can now begin to analyze those and look at data in a different way. That's modification. Here we have an example of modification directly from iBooks Author again, but it really focuses on the idea that we can give students immediate feedback. Here you see a little quiz uh, in the middle of the text, so the text is presented. The students can take a little self-check quiz and see if they understood what they need to understand from the reading. Couple that with other tools like Socrative or tools like um, our Google Forms, and you as a teacher can also have a sense of how, how much they understood. That's the level of modification where we're getting feedback from students and about student learning constantly as they read, something that before we, we would have them read and then we would get the feedback from them afterward. The final stage is redefinition. Now redefinition is definitely not some place that we spend a lot of time in. It is a place that we visit from time to time. Our best lessons, our biggest ideas are often living in the world of redefinition when we adopt technology, but it's something that's difficult to do every single day. In the world of redefinition, what happens is older tasks are replaced in part or in whole by newly designed tasks because you're trying to do something you could never do before. And that's the key with redefinition. You've completely redefined how you teach and how students demonstrate learning because of what the technology allows you to do. As a result of this, there really are stronger improvements in student learning at this level. But this is a difficult level to maintain all of the time for many teachers because it's constantly forcing you to innovate where the other levels don't necessarily require innovation in the same way. The key about redefinition is that we can now challenge things like time, place, and space where learning happens. Students can connect with people from the outside world. Students can um, begin to publish to greater, wider audiences. So here's an example, just kind of generally take it from my books. You'll see a couple of screenshots here, but using iBooks, students can now publish their iBook for the world to see. We're talking about truly authentic audiences, getting truly authentic feedback from those audiences, and, um, and now having somebody other than just the teacher or just your peers in your classroom reading your stuff, you can actually, for the, you can actually publish it to the whole world. And with something like iBooks Author, we can now really change what content looks like. We can now have video and audio and, and links and all sorts of things coupled together in a format that really allows the students to teach us what they know instead of just maybe show us what they know. Another tool from iTunes U is a very similar concept, right? We can pull resources from the outside world. We can push those resources back to the outside world. With recent changes in iTunes U, you, there's even now some level of discussion within. So we can connect and talk with people that we've never even met, but all are enrolled in the same courses. So there's just that screenshot of, of iTunes U. So that is redefinition, and that is the SAMR model in a nutshell. 
Remember, the key with all of this is we grow. None of these places are bad places to be. But as we grow with our understanding of technology, our aim really needs to be thinking about how we can modify the instructional practices in our classroom to take full advantage of the technology, to allow our students to engage more deep, deeply, to be more creative and collaborative, and to really bear the heavy weight of the work, the brunt of the work of learning, which is what modification and redefinition are all about. But none of these are places that we can skip, and none of these are places that we uh, we should ever avoid or feel guilty about not about being in, because these are all valuable places, because STAMR is about the growth model of technology adoption. Thank you so much for your time, and I hope this has clarified and introduced the concept of the SAMR model.